All I want to do is to kind of rapidly run through the rest of the letter and, 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 and highlight a few things. Um, one of them is uh, in the very next pericope. Uh, so it's labeled in here as exordium or hodiya prayer, uh, Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. Um, these terms that I've thrown in the commentary, exordium is a rhetorical term, not a liturgical term. It's a term that, that really just means um, introduction. <laughs> we're going to ignore that for now because we're focusing on the liturgical side. Hodiya is another um, Hebrew term for a type of prayer. Um, Buraka is a, a prayer that begins with the word blessed. And Hodiya has more the sense of thanksgiving. Uh, and there's really very little difference between the two um, patterns of prayer aside from the vocabulary because I argued just a few minutes ago that blessing and thanksgiving are very close to one another. Um, the, the surprising fact is simply that Paul has two of them in this letter, that he is so focused uh, on uh, praise and prayer that he does it twice. Um, in a typical... Um, I think he noticed, but uh, in a typical Hellenistic letter, the writer gives thanks early on for something that he perceives that's good about the person he's writing to. I give thanks to all the gods that they have blessed you with such riches and intelligence and that you have been so kind to my family and so on. It's, a, it's part of the sort of buttering up part of the letter. The, the capturing of goodwill, because the next line is going to be, I'd like you to lend me a hundred drachmas, you know. There's always going to be a, um, a request coming afterwards. What Paul does is he transforms it. He only briefly gives thanks for anything that's a quality in the people he's writing to, and then very quickly moves on to talk about God again. So in verse 15, he says, Having, um, having heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love toward the saints, I do not cease giving thanks to you, making remembrance of you at the time of my prayers. But he's, he's pretty much done with saying anything about them at that point. He's mentioned their faith, their love. Now he's going to talk about what God has done. And that's a remarkable feature of all of, of, of Paul's letters. One um, minor liturgical reference here at the end of verse 16 is the way I've translated this. Um, most of your English versions will say, remembering you in my prayers. But the, the Greek expression there is an expression that refers to specific times. And so uh, it's epi plus the genitive for those of you who care. And so I've translated it not as just whenever I pray, but rather at the specific times when I do the prayers. That's rather over-translating it. But I think what's going on here is Paul is making reference to the fact that he has continued the pious Jewish practice of prayer three times a day, morning, noon, and at night, uh, which eventually develop into the daily offices of the church. Um, when Paul does those prayers, what does he do? He does what any good pastor does. He prays for his flock. Uh, he has taken upon himself the burden of the people the Lord sent him to. And he prays for them, verse 17, again, uh, for the blessing of the Holy Trinity. So notice once more, double underlined, he prays that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, might give to you the spirits of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Um, you, uh, the more you look for it, the more astonished you become at how Trinitarian the New Testament really is. You know, we sometimes like to, to, to think, well, you've got the Holy Trinity in Matthew 28, and then you've got that benediction at the end of 2 Corinthians, and then the rest of it, you kind of have to try really hard uh, to, to, to find the Trinity in the Bible. And uh, I've come to think that's quite the opposite. You have to try really hard to miss the Trinity uh, because 
Paul is constantly thinking in a Trinitarian fashion. Um, and whether he means it in a symbolic manner or not, he continuously groups his petitions into threes. Uh, so uh, the prayer is that you would, uh, in verse 18, know three things. What is the hope of his calling? What is the richness of his glorious inheritance? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power? I don't know if he means that in a Trinitarian fashion or if it's just that things work well in threes, uh, but he started it out with a very Trinitarian uh, uh, introduction. He then once again uh, goes into a proclamation of the gospel in creedal language. Um, the power of God is not in and of itself good news. That's another Nagelism uh, in, in his criticisms of Augustine, where uh, 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 Augustine likes to think that the greatness of God is a good thing, but it all depends on whether the power and greatness of God is there to condemn you or to save you. Uh, just as the power of an army, you know, is one thing if it's behind you, uh, uh, and it's another thing if it's coming at you, uh, or if it's surrounding you uh, and defending you. So what is it that is so uh, uh, marvelously gracious about the power of God is that God used that power to raise Jesus Christ from the dead, to seat him at his right hand in the heavenly places, um, far above every ruler and authority and power and lordship and every name that is named. So all those demons and false gods that you were worried about as Gentiles living in Ephesus, Christ is above them all. They are under his feet like defeated enemies, uh, and you need not worry about them because you are there with him as the body of Christ who is the head. Now, um, how did you get there to be with him? Paul makes clear in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, uh, when he uses very baptismal language to say, you have died with Christ, you have risen with Christ, and you have ascended into heaven with Christ. Um, something that makes no sense at all if you try to take it literally or as the eyes see. Quite clearly, I'm not in heaven, I'm in Illinois. Um, sorry, that wasn't an insult. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Iowa, that was Beth, right. Um, no, uh, it doesn't look like, uh, and this is the same thing as the Sursum Corda, you know, uh, set your eyes on heavenly things, uh, where you are with Jesus Christ. This is how Paul puts it here, and it is because you have been baptized into him. Now, uh, time is very short, and I think in chapter 2, I'm not going to suggest that there's all kinds of uh, references to the liturgy, although it dances around it in many ways, because 1 through 10 is so very focused on what God has done to you in baptism, and 11 through 22, um, what God has done for you in the death of Christ on the cross, which has liturgical consequences. So what was the great negative of being a Gentile? Um, in this section, it is that you were cut off from the worshipful communion of Israel. And what I argue in the commentary is that this can be understood uh, more deeply if you think about the charge on which Paul was arrested, because this is a prison epistle. It's something that Paul writes shortly after he's been arrested in Jerusalem. And the charge on which, which Paul was arrested, uh, perhaps fabricated by the Jews, was that he had taken a Gentile into the uh, court of the Jews in the, the temple and violated the dividing line that the Gentiles weren't supposed to cross. And um, uh, most remarkably, the, the person they saw him with happened to be from Ephesus. And so I kind of make big, uh, something big out of this, uh, that um, Paul takes up this very issue uh, because it affected the Ephesians directly, that Trophimus the Ephesian had been seen with Paul. But to get to the sort of theological and worshipful point, whether or not the Jews were right to, uh, to, to force the Gentiles to stay outside even the court of the women, um, 
and behind this wall called the Soreg, um, they were in a disadvantaged situation. They could not come close to God as his chosen people could. And Paul argues that in the work of Christ on the cross, this division has been destroyed so that all men, Jews and Gentiles together, and in Galatians he'll say men and women, slaves and free, uh, as in other places, have been brought together in Christ. And if you are in Christ, then you can come as close to the throne of the Father as Christ does. Uh, so in some senses, you're even better than the Jews ever were. Because even, well, the Jewish women could only go in so far. Even the Jewish men could only go in so far because only the priests could go up to, to, to the steps of the altar, only the priests could go into the holy place, and then only the high priest could go into the holy of holies. So nobody um, uh, had that most intimate access uh, to God, even in Israel, except on the one day of the year when the high priest goes in. And um, Paul says all of this has been transformed in Christ. Verse 18, for through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. And so then you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens built up into uh, a temple of the Holy Spirit. I won't read the whole thing. Um, what Paul is saying, uh, again, in a rich Trinitarian way, is that Christ has not simply allowed us to worship God, regardless of whether we're Jew or Gentile, in the same way, but that Christ is actually the vehicle of our worship of the Father. So that it's not simply that, that, that Christ stands next to the Father's throne, and when he sees us coming, he whispers to the Father, it's okay, let them in, you know, they're with me. Kind of like um, John getting Peter access to, uh, 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 to, to the uh, high priest's courtyard because you know, the people knew him. But rather that it is actually Jesus standing with us who are far off, incorporating us into himself and walking us into the Father's throne. So that if you get your understanding of the Trinity right, Jesus is actually doing the worship with us and for us, the worship of his Father. Through him and with him, empowered by the Spirit, uh, we come before the Father's throne. So it's, um, it's, not just, um, it's not just the Gentiles now gain what only the Jews once had, but that Jews and Gentiles together are, are given something uh, that nobody ever had. The closest that ever came to it was the high priest. But now, uh, in Christ Jesus, uh, because of our baptism into him, uh, we have the most intimate access. We have, as it were, the access of the Son himself. Now, Paul exercises that access at the end of chapter 3. Um, uh, so I'm skipping uh, verses 1 through 13 uh, for the, uh, just in the interest of the remaining time we have. And in contemplation of the great mysteries of chapters 2 and the beginning of 3, the revelation of this incredible way of salvation and, and all the rest, Paul is driven to his knees. Verse 14, for this reason, I bend my knees to the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that he might grant to you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit for the inner man, that Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith, so that you being rooted and founded in love might be fully enabled to comprehend with all the saints what is its breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you might be filled up to all the fullness of God. And then he concludes with this remarkable doxology. Uh, so Paul does not simply speak about prayer, but he actually does it. He prays for them. 
And one of the observations, um, aside from the Trinitarian stuff, which I think I can kind of go without saying now at this point, you can see um, uh, how his prayer is Trinitarian in pattern, is that Paul's prayer is actually structured in a very familiar way to us, in a way that is very familiar to us. First of all, he addresses the Father. I bend my knee to the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Uh, this doesn't work terribly well in English, in which the word family is not related to the word father, but in Greek, the word for family is patria, and the word for father is pater. So it's kind of a play on words in Greek, where he says, we as God's family um, have an in with him because we're named after him. So it would almost be as if we we're to say, um, I have access to my father's house because I'm a winger, and he's a winger. And, and that, you know, when I show up at the door, he lets me in because we share the same name, which is incidentally, I think, why we begin the liturgy with the Trinitarian invocation, right? God says, who's there and why should I let you in? And we say, because I bear your name. So we, Paul begins this prayer here by speaking the name of the Father and explaining why the Father should hear him, because he, he bears his name. And then he expresses what he wants to ask. He prays that God would give uh, the indwelling of Christ. And then he expresses what consequence he'd like to flow from that, that you would be rooted and founded in the love of Christ. And when he's done, he concludes his prayer with doxology. And it struck me that this is exactly the pattern of praying that we follow in what we call the collect the collect pattern, that there is an address in which we name our God, followed by some sort of reference to why God should hear us, because you have promised always to hear those who come before you, uh, because you showed us grace in your son, Jesus Christ. I'm just kind of making this up. But here, it's because we bear your name. And then the, uh, the, the, the colic pattern classically goes on to a petition. What is it that you're asking for? And then a, a result or benefit. Was it, what is it that you want to happen because of that? And then in light of the, um, the graciousness of God who hears these, praise, these prayers, uh, we offer him uh, doxology. Now, this is another chicken and egg thing. Uh, do we pray this way? because we learned it from Paul, or does Paul pray this way because this is the way people were already praying? Um, I think it's a bit of both, um, and that there is a certain resemblance between this and the Barakah prayer that we were talking about earlier, that you begin by saying what God has done for you, and then you ask him to do more for you. Uh, so you always root your prayers in what God has done. Uh, but uh, learning to pray in collect pattern uh, is biblical, uh, and it teaches us how and why God listens. Uh, God listens because he has given us access to him through re revealing to us his name, through incorporating us into his son, Jesus Christ, whom he listens to, uh, and by giving us uh, requests that are pleasing to him. One last liturgical fragment uh, before we close, and that is to turn to chapter 4. Chapter 4 begins with an exhortation uh, to unity in the Spirit. And Paul does not simply want to hammer this into them with exhortations uh, or demands, but wants to root it in who they actually are. And who they are is people who have already been made one. And so he appeals to that in verses four through six. And what I've done here is to lay it out in such a way that you can see the remarkable structuring. Um, in Greek, there isn't even a main verb in any of this, except in that little parenthesis, you were called. 
but it is simply there is one body and one spirit, one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Now, we said earlier that creeds in the New Testament that emphasize the oneness of God are rooted in the Old Testament Shema and are typical eventually of the creeds of the Eastern Church, which we come to know through the Nicene Creed. They're rooted right here in this language. What's remarkable about this fragment, count the occurrences of the word one. It's got dotted underline to help you. There's seven ones. Seven is the number of divine perfection. And then how many, so to speak, stanzas or sections of the creed are there? There are three. Uh, And so the perfect unity of God has been given to us through the Holy Trinity. One Spirit, one Lord, one Father. Uh, And in the middle of it all, Paul makes it explicit in case you didn't get it. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. So he appeals to the fact that they have been given a unity through baptism uh, in the Trinity that transcends any differences they may have uh, between one another. So this, I I guess, will be the the, the final uh, uh, liturgical hint here, that perhaps Paul is even appealing to a creed that they know, an external testimony, an authority that they can all agree on. How can you be at odds with one another? How can you feel that you are divided from one another when you were made one uh, in your baptism into the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, It's interesting that he does it in reverse of our creedal pattern. He goes Spirit, uh, Son, Father. Um, Luther makes a comment in the large catechism that this is the order of experience. Uh, He says, you know, you can begin with the Father and on to the Son and on to the Spirit. But in terms of our experience, the Spirit leads us to the Son and the Son leads us to the Father. And so you can can run the, the Trinity either way if you wish. And Paul does it this way. All right. We're at the end of our time. Any comments or thoughts about Ephesians 2, 3, and 4 that I just ran you through? We really have already talked about 5 and 6 because we did that earlier. We're well exhausted at this point. That's fine. Thank you so much. Good.